potential to look like is decimated communities, decimated economies, decimated workforces, decimated families. We have an epidemic amongst African Americans that is just exploded. We only represent 13% of the total population, but we represent somewhere around 57% of those who are infected with HIV and AIDS. Here in the trenches in Harlem, my people are suffering. My people are dying. And I could not stand here today and not express the passion and the commitment and the concern that I have. We must put an end to this. Every time I start talking about it, it brings it back because he died in my arms and you just can't believe you know you keep every day you keep hoping that there will be a cure before you know or well, before he gets too bad or before he dies there's going to be a cure there's going to be something that's going to save them and then when the end you know that if it does come it's too late for him now <laughs> And I remember what she looked like when she had flu, and then I had the flu. She didn't look anything like I did. I felt afraid. I don't know why, but I just felt afraid. I'm sitting there thinking, I want to do the right things. I want to get my baby back. And now I'm going to die. A lot of people, I think, still had it, thought that, you know, it, it ain't gonna happen to me. But it's game. It happened to me. It really is a war against not just the virus, but it is a war against ignorance. How do we find a way to get control of a disease that has control over our communities, that's taking out young brothers and sisters at a rate that is astronomical? The house is on fire, and we need water. We don't need to figure out where the fire is coming from or even who set the fires. We can't do anything about how this fire is raging. All we can do is put it out. Sweet, sweet in the mountain. On this program, we'll look at the raging epidemic, the dread disease of HIV and AIDS. Uh, my guest at this time is Dr. Kendrick, who is the director of the City of Houston Health Department. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Councilmember. Dr. Kendrick, December 1st, 1999, you, uh, at the direction of the mayor, uh, put together a program in which the mayor issued a declaration of a state of emergency in the city of Houston with regard to HIV and AIDS in the African American community. Can you tell us about that and tell us why we were forced to call a state of emergency? Absolutely. As we look at the trends here in Houston affecting our community, we have noticed a dramatic and continued increase in HIV AIDS in the African American community. As a matter of fact, in 1999, all of the data in suggests that all of the new HIV infections of all of those, 61% of those are occurring in the African American community. And as uh, we look at new infections and what this means for our community, it can be extremely devastating. We talk about stress that African Americans experience on a daily yearly basis. You add on to this HIV AIDS, you're talking about some serious issues affecting our entire community from, from infancy to our elderly community. Correct. How do we come to be 61 percent of all the newly reported infections of HIV and AIDS? Well that's a good question. We all know that there are certain kinds of risk-taking behaviors that lead to a positive test for HIV. 
We also know that there are a good number of myths, a good number of misperceptions about HIV AIDS in the African American community. And part of our responsibility collectively is to make sure that those myths are dispelled, that accurate information is provided to our entire community, and that individuals take this accurate information and begin to look at what they're doing with themselves, with their families, and their community to reduce the numbers and hopefully eliminate the problems that we're having here. Is there something particular or special or unique about the characteristics of our population, why our response seems to be so limited? Well, I don't know that there's anything unique or different. We all engage in certain kinds of behaviors based on the information that we have. We have seen the dramatic increases that occurred in the white male gay community and the impact of information and education and a very focused and coordinated effort to bring information and to change the behaviors that resulted in positive HIV. So we know that we all bring to the table the same kinds of issues. It's a matter of how we handle the issues. A lot of that is based on information. A lot of that is based on ad adequate and very, very um, uh, good quality information education. But it's also based on the focus, the resources, the individualized kind of attention, the kind of attention to this issue that we get uh, in, in group activities, in schools, in churches, uh, wherever we congregate. And it's a matter of getting that I accurate information, dispelling any of those inaccurate myths, taking responsibility for what we know is our community responsibility, and acting that out in our daily lives. The, um the health department has developed a plan of action, a strategic plan of action. Uh, as part of that, I was asked by you and the mayor to serve as chair of the task force. Could you describe the elements of the plan of action and how the city has strategized to respond to this crisis of HIV and AIDS in the African American community? Absolutely. It has to start with good information, accurate information, and so a uh, big part of our plan of action is focused on public information, information available on an individualized basis, group ba basis, having the information and the educational opportunities there and available. The second is community mobilization. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to actually do something to make a difference. And part of the community mobilization that we've been looking to, um, to effect is where we engage in individual, behavioral kinds of things to make a change. The other is where we also engage within our families in those kinds of changes that will make a difference here in the community. The other is when we engage at a community level, however we define community, be it a ch church, uh, be it our neighborhood, be it at the Y, be it in our schools, to make a difference. So community uh, mobilization, we have been working very aggressively with community-based organizations, with churches. You, you have been a key premier person in moving that forward. And so engaging in as many opportunities with the media and with our community-based organizations, with our individuals, everyone can take and should take an individualized role and stance in what they can do. And then the other is the behavioral changes and focusing on what works best. In some communities, it's going to be the individualized kinds of sit-downs, uh, exchanging information, looking at personalized kinds of issues. In other settings, it's going to be small groups. In other settings, it may be a larger group. It may be a church. It may be in a crisis counseling session. To have as many opportunities for individuals to review what they're doing, to review what they're doing with other people because we're not just exposing ourselves but clearly exposing others to HIV AIDS and all of the very serious consequences of that. And as we look at it today, 61% in 1999 of new HIV infections in our African American community, that has devastating implications. We all grow up hopeful of having many opportunities to express ourselves in the future, be it in our professional life, in our personal lives. But if hope is gone, if we're spending a lot of our energy and attention on medical issues and bills instead of the issues of healthy families going to school, getting jobs, being a productive member of our community, we're spending a lot of time and attention individually and within our families focusing on very, very devastating issues. So it's a very tough issue for all of us, 
we are all either involved one way or other with individuals, with groups who, uh, of, of, of uh, people who have HIV AIDS, and it's something that we have to take very seriously. Mm. What neighborhoods are being specifically targeted in the plan of action? We have several neighborhoods in the city of Houston. That includes the north side of town, northeast side of town, Antoine, also the southwest part of town, Sunnyside, Riverside, Lyons area. These are areas where our numbers are high in our African American community. And so we are working very closely with as many individuals, as many groups as we can in these areas to make a difference, including billboards that uh, are going up all over town, including a good number of public radio uh, messages, TV messages, and on all of our City of Houston Health Department cars, we have a combination of those billboards up also. So we're trying to get that information out. But we're most importantly also trying to get individuals and groups to sit down and plan specifically on what they're going to do within their community. This high-risk behavior that you spoke about, what are the kinds of behaviors that in fact are risky? The risky behaviors involve sex and drugs, injection drug use, any kind of drugs, anything that essentially will make us less thoughtful in the kinds of behaviors we engage in. So if you're taking a lot of alcohol, if you're using drugs, then there's more of a propensity to engage in risk-taking behaviors. At the same time, if you're using uh, needles, then that blood exposure increases your risk dramatically. Uh, we're also talking about sexual activity. Anytime you're engaged in sex, unprotected sex with anyone, you are at risk for getting HIV AIDS. So it's that combination of drug use and also sexual activity. And of course, it's not a one-on-one -on -one kind of transmission. For young women, we're also looking at the impact on their babies. Even though HIV AIDS is a dread disease, all of them are 100% preventable. Correct. What is the message to get to people about prevention and why is it so difficult to get um, people to change their sexual behavior? Well, the issues have to do with human behavior. And we know that sexual behavior is gratifying for a good number of individuals. It's a very uh, normal part of life. When you engage in sexual activity, however, with an individual who is also engaged in act sexual activity with someone else, then your risk increases. So what we're saying is that we know that people will be engaged in sexual activity. Based on your risk, you have to consider what the consequences are of your actions. And therefore, if you're going to be engaged in sexual activity with anyone, particularly if this is not a monogamous kind of relationship, then you must take those precautions. We're trying to make sure that our youth are not involved in sexual activity. We're trying to make sure that adults are engaged in preventive kinds of measures, using condoms at all times, and making sure that they're taking care of their health. Well, we've made some great strides, but I think we've got a long way to go. The, uh, the crisis of HIV and AIDS is quite frightening and it's been devastating to people of African descent all over the world. Mm -hmm. It does not seem like we're getting a handle on this uh, very easily. No, it doesn't. However, I do think that we can and will make a difference. We do have drugs, very expensive drugs and very difficult drugs to take that are um, shedding light on the virus itself and what can be done hopefully in new research to make a difference in terms of cures. However, as you stated a couple of minutes ago, HIV AIDS is totally 100% preventable. And so I think we do have information that shows that if people know what the risk factors are and if they are reinforced in all of those positive ways of not putting yourself at risk, if people are aware, if they're informed, if that kind of behavior between two people is one that supports you being healthy based on my interaction and my behavior with you, if we continue to do that and provide that information because it is 100% preventable, we do know that it can make a difference. I do also think it's very important for people not to depend on drugs. If you know anyone, and many of us do, who is taking AIDS medication, 
it is a very, very difficult regimen to take. And it is not something that anyone wants to get involved with, if at all possible. So we know it's 100% preventable. We know that we can make a difference, but we have to start almost one person at a time to make that difference. And I do believe we can. We have seen it work in different communities. We just need to all be a part of making it happen. We know that there are people who dismiss accurate information. They want to really say that it's something that's being put upon the African American community. Well, until we have better information, we'd better do what we need to do right now with the information that we have right now to make a difference. And that is individual behavior as far as sexual activity is concerned and as far as drugs are concerned. And that makes for a healthier body and a healthier community, period. Well, thank you for being with us. Um, thank you. We'll be right back with more on our program in just a few minutes. My friends call me Miss Mouth. Because, well, I'm always in somebody's face about something. They kept telling me I was going to lose my boyfriend if I didn't stop being in his face all the time. So, the one time I should have been in his face, I kept my mouth shut. Do you know what I'm talking about? Don't be a fool, girlfriend. Do you hear me? If he wants to share it, he's got to wear it. Tell him. It's like the elephant in the living room. And, you know, the elephant sits there, and everybody's like, well, you know, the elephant's there, but if you ignore it long enough, it's going to go away. And then on top of it, people are saying, plus, it's not on our side of the room. You know, it's an elephant sitting over in that corner. So it doesn't have anything to do with us. And time goes on, and time goes on, and after a while, the elephant continues to eat, and the elephant continues to get bigger, and all of a sudden, the elephant's taking up the whole room, and you can't breathe or anything. But we're still saying to ourselves, you know, if we keep ignoring it, it's going to go away. And the reality is, it's not going to go away. And the longer that we continue to ignore it, the larger the elephant's going to grow. And that's what HIV is about in communities of color. We continue to ignore it, and it doesn't go away. Steve Walker is who we describe as our frontline freedom fighter in the city of Houston's strategic plan of action in the state of emergency with regard to HIV and AIDS. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. Can you talk about the mythology that surrounds this dread disease? There are a lot of people who still look at HIV as a gay white disease. So that's the overarching myth that exists. HIV is not my problem, it's those people's problem. So it's gay white men, it's prostitutes, it's injecting drug users, it's everybody else except that person. And so that's why for this entire year and for the future of HIV prevention, the challenge is to get people to identify with those risks personally. So anyone who's had one sexual contact, anybody who's been sharing butt, blood or body products with any other person is at risk for HIV. In terms of the age population, the range of people who are HIV positive uh, ranges from young to very old. Uh, is the youth population a particular at risk population for HIV? 6% of 1999 infections for the city of Houston were people ages 13 to 18. So these were people who were exposed to HIV by having unprotected sex or other high risk activities with someone else. So we clearly see that young people are at risk for HIV just as well as anyone else. Uh, when we were at the Houston Independent School District, they said that the, their surveys showed that young people began sexual experimentation at age 11. Mm -hmm. So some sexual activity even, even that young. Right. We know that we have to start talking to young people about preventing sexually transmitted diseases, pregnancy, HIV, by abstinence, number one. But however, if kids are sexually active, they need to know what the options are. So we do have an abstinence-based educational program for middle schools, and we start talking more about risk reduction for high school age kids. Thomas Melanson's recently developed a play with some young people called A Song of Abstinence. And is that what you're talking about? Well, that's the Song of Absence is one of the strategies, and actually it's an excellent play, and we hope to be able to take that play to more and more schools in the coming school year. Uh, it's a peer-based model, and we know peer-based education is what works best. People learn best from people who look and think and act more like them. So actually having young adults talking about prevention of H HIV, STDs, and pregnancy is critical to our battle against HIV and STD transmission. There are a number of community-based groups that have formed 
in and of their own initiative. And one of the statistics I remember hearing from some African-American women is that every 30 minutes an African-American woman becomes HIV positive. Is that true? There's definitely statistics that supports that. In fact, in throughout the country, every hour, seven people are infected with HIV, and five of them are African-American. So definitely, we know that um, every hour, every day, and not only in Houston, but across the country, across the world, more and more people are being infected with HIV. And as you said many times, a disease that's 100% preventable. And the thing that we try to drive home with the message that people are hearing, particularly among women, Yes, African-American women are being infected with HIV, and we've got to constantly talk to African-American women about HIV transmission and STDs, but almost 100% of the time, they're infected by a male partner, an mm -hmm. African-American male partner. So there's still a group of people in the community that we have to mobilize, and that's African-American men to understand their role in HIV prevention. Regardless of sexual orientation, we find that African-American men are not as involved in HIV prevention as they should be. We in the United States are supposed to be sophisticated. That's one thing to look at sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, emerging nations there that are underdeveloped, uh, non-industrial, rural, not organized, poor, um, new democracies. But it's another thing to look at the sophisticated uh, upper middle income, middle income, professional, college educated, trained uh, people of African descent, African Americans here, and we seem to have as much, if not as big or bigger a problem than do the people in the emerging nations. What, what's going on? What's up with that? It goes back to that myth. So the people that you just described are the very ones who disassociate their potential risk for HIV. Um, and, and actually, if you think about how AIDS first started in the United States, sure, the first group of people that show complications from this weird disease that was once referred to as gay-related immune disorder. So it wasn't even called AIDS. If you were not white and gay, you did not identify with this disease. And even black and Latino gay men did not identify with GRID or, or even AIDS because they didn't live in New York, San Francisco, or Los Angeles, and they were not white gay men. Mm -hmm. That has perpetuated throughout the years, and it's one of the things that we are still battling constantly. And we try to tell people HIV is a disease of what people do and not who they are. Mm. It doesn't matter if you're 12 and you're having your first sexual expo uh, exposure or if you're 72 and you're having your a sexual encounter. Anyone who has unprotected sex or shares needles with someone else can be at risk for HIV. One of the communities that you have uh, made particular efforts in, to reach out to is the faith community. Uh, we've even been able to develop some strong partnerships with pharmaceutical companies like Glaxo Welcome that have sponsored programs with Yolanda Adams and uh, with um, uh, uh, the Bomb and Gilead program and so forth. But there's also some particular challenges with dealing with the black church. And um, uh, there seems to be some question. I remember listening to Permessa. Permessa Seal. Seal talk about the challenge of the black church with the assertion that uh, HIV is tied to sin. We know that regardless of what a person's faith is, there have always been so some sort of disease that have made people outcasts. Mm. So it might have been leprosy. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there were challenges for Christians in that time of how to deal with lepers. So again, I think we have to take things in a current cultural context. We have to look at the disease um, separate from anything else and what people's perceptions may be and treat not only those people who are positive for HIV, but again, since we know it's preventable, we've got to talk about how people can prevent it. One of the challenges for churches is, of course, you have to talk about sex. Um, the overwhelming majority of HIV is transmitted by unprotected sex, whether it's female to male, male to male, male to female. Sex has a large role in transmission of HIV. The African-American church has been the backbone of the African-American community on several critical issues, mm -hmm. whether it's civil rights, whether it's voter registration, whether it's racial profiling. HIV is the biggest challenge for the African-American community um, as we speak. There won't be anybody to put money into the collection plate on Sundays if everybody's HIV positive and dies. Mm -hmm. There won't be any leaders in the African-American community to replace persons like yourself um, if everyone is infected with HIV. So the church has got to be one of those organizations that pulls people together, people from all different backgrounds, and look at how we can address the epidemic together. The um, 
um, Surgeon General has said that research does not indicate that the distribution of condoms increases the likelihood of someone being engaged in sexual activity and the distribution of needles or needle exchange programs does not um, increase the number of people who um, uh, are IV drug users. Uh, does this suggest that there ought to be a public policy debate in your mind at this time about perhaps needle exchange programs in the state of Texas and condom distribution uh, programs in the state prison system? I, I think it's clearly one of the things that we have to look at. If we know that there are certain ways of preventing diseases, regardless of what they are, we have to look at how we can best implement those practices in our, our, our environment. We clearly know that a syringe exchange program would work for people who are injecting drug users because that's how HIV is transmitted by infected and contaminated blood being shared in needles. So a syringe exchange program would clearly work. We clearly know that there is um, higher rates of HIV infection among people who are incarcerated. And we know for a fact that condoms work in preventing transmission of STDs and HIV. Well, one might suggest that uh, if one is in prison, um, you know, you're not going to be able to engage in sexual activity. But what I questioned or challenged them with was that if you had a sentence for 15 years uh, in prison, incarceration, are you really fully able to make a commitment and say today that you wouldn't have any sexual activity for 15 years? Uh, most people I've seen in this society don't have that kind of uh, level of self-discipline generally for 15 minutes or 15 months, much less 15 years, and we've seen very, very long prison terms, and in fact, increasingly longer prison terms uh, in this state and in this society. Let me ask you about another thing that we've talked about before, and that is that when you look at statistics of rates of infection for disease, and particularly STDs and uh, HIV infection, for example, I think uh, last year there were 1,441 newly reported uh, infections of HIV, uh, you're saying that the number is higher than the 1,400 newly reported cases. That's right, because those are only the people that have been diagnosed with HIV because they've been tested either at a health center or a community organization or a hospital system or private physician. We in public health know that we've got to multiply that number by 10 or 15 or even 20 to get the true number of people that could have possibly been exposed. So if last year there were 1,500 people that were confirmed, potentially there could be 15, 30,000 people that could have been exposed to HIV. The average person has two to three sex partners. Well, then just multiply that number by two to three, and there could be many more people that's HIV positive as we speak. So that's why our public information campaigns are hitting on the fact that everybody, regardless of age, regardless of race, regardless of sexual orientation, needs to take advantage of HIV testing. What are some of the uh, upcoming uh, programs that we can anticipate from the city of Houston that, uh, and the community-based organizations? Well, I spoke earlier about the need to get more African-American men mobilized. Uh, so we're going to have an, an event specifically targeting African-American male community. Also, we're going to have the first ever mayor's conference for business and labor leaders because they play a key role in not only education of employees but potentially having businesses more active in the state of emergency and HIV prevention efforts and that'll be coming up later in the year as well as an, a conference looking at what's happened with the state of emergency since it was declared in December of 1999. Um, pretty soon it'll be a full year so we'll be able to recap some of the things that we've done, look at where we are in terms of statistics and maybe chart our course for the future. We're actually very fortunate that one of the largest conferences for HIV prevention will be coming to Houston in the year 2001, and that's the HIV Prevention Community Planning Leadership Summit. And so it's an opportunity for people in the community to engage with people from around the country. When is that scheduled? That's actually scheduled for March of 2001. Well, we've uh, been able to do a lot on this journey together, and uh, certainly the war rages on, but I want to commend you and thank you for all that you've done. You've been the heart and soul of our effort, and you've truly been um, a modern-day hero and freedom fighter in this effort. Thank, thank you, you, Steve. Thank you. Over the course of this program, we've looked at a lot of things that are surrounding the state of emergency in Houston's community, particularly the African-American community with regard to HIV and AIDS. The most important thing to remember 
is that all STDs and HIV AIDS in particular are 100% preventable. Let's do what we can to win this war and to win it for all of us. Thank you.